Hello, good afternoon. Uh, John Kilroy here from the Dublin Academy of Education History Teacher. We're going to have a look now at uh, the various questions that might come up on the Ireland Sovereignty and Partition section of your Leaving Cert course. And we're going to focus on this, the Irish Free State, 1922 to 1949, which we can divide nicely into four parts. Okay, State building, as I call it, our consolidation of democracy. We're going to do an essay plan on this one now. Language, culture and religion. This can come up between 1922 and 1949. It's a tricky topic, especially the culture part. Okay. But it could include the Eucharistic Congress, and it could be just a question on the Eucharistic Congress as well. So that's uh, also worth having a look at. Society and economy, 1922 to 1949. Society and economy, not just economy, the economy with the implications for society. And of course, everybody's favourite, Anglo-Irish relations, 1922 to 1949. The bad news for you was it was up last year, but that doesn't mean it's not coming up this year. So we're going to do a plan for this one today. Okay? So if we look at the past questions, 2006, between 19... There are variations in the theme, first of all, okay? The variations is between 1922 and 1949. The question go from 1922 which was the establishment of the Free State, to 1949, the Declaration and Establishment of the Irish Republic. Okay? So those years. Now, there can be a variation on a theme within those years. So this one, 1922 to 1932, what steps the Cosgrave government take to establish the Irish Free State on firm foundations? That's clearly a question about this here. Okay? What steps did Irish, the Irish government take to consolidate democracy? 1923, to the end of the emergency, 1945. So again, a variation on a, on a theme, 2008. And 2011, how did Irish governments contribute to the consolidation of democracy? 1922 to 1932. So we're talking about Cumann na Gael here, the Cumann na Gael government of Cosgrave and uh, O'Higgins and people like that, okay? Uh, of course, you do know that the pursuit of sovereignty every was a, a DBQ question. So when we look at 2014 and 2015, it's not really relevant because it was uh, the compulsory question that year. And then we get into modern times, 2018, during the period 1922 to 1945. How effective were the governments of both Cosgrave and De Valera in dealing with the threats to the security of the state? One of the fundamental questions about Ireland when it emerged and got the Anglo-Irish Treaty and their, their independence on the 6th of December 1921 was, of course, first of all, was it economically viable as a country? Secondly, would it turn into a dictatorship like what was happening in, in Europe to a lot of countries? I mean, dictatorship is an easy path to take for leaders at this particular point, okay? Uh, and uh, how would it cope with the security threats to the state, the immediate one being the IRA's rejection of the treaty? And how would they cope with that? Uh, so all of these are these big questions. Of course, and the main group outside the law in Ireland during these years was the IRA, which uh, uh, became important at certain times and then diminished in importance at other times. Do you see? So uh, that's what we're going to be looking at. So we're going to do sort of a generic plan that will cover all of those things. Now, I know none of the questions went up to 1949, but imagine it did, you know? Imagine it started in 22 and went up to 49 and you had only revised to 45 and you couldn't talk about the inter-party inter government and you couldn't talk about the Nationality Act and you couldn't talk about the Declaration of the Republic, you see? So the idea of the Republic, of course, is very interesting. Okay, so I'm going to just turn off this and uh, we're going to do a plan like uh, we did in the last lesson. And we'll start off, um, 
You might want to include the civil war in your answer. You might not want to use the civil war in your answer. We're not going to do it here today because we, you can slip that in pretty quickly. We're starting with the introduction, okay? The introduction, and uh, we will talk about, briefly, about the Anglo Irish Treaty. Okay, very briefly, you don't need to go into the terms or anything like that, you just need to say that it set up the, established the Irish Free State, okay, and uh, so the country was independent, yeah, and of course, that came into full, it was signed on the 6th of December 1921, but it came into full implementation on the 6th of December 1922, okay, uh, and you'll talk about the Civil War, okay, and one of the consequences of the Civil War, of course, was the division of the country. It was uh, unnecessary uh, at the time. It was going to be a very difficult period of time anyway with the economy and things like that. But also, we have the death of Griffith and Collins, the two leaders of pro-treaty Sinn Féin, who are about to give themselves a new name, uh, and the emergence of Cosgrave, the Minister of Local Government, suddenly, suddenly elevated to being leader of the country. Okay? It would be like if some sort of thing happened where Varadkar and Pascal and uh, Coveney disappeared and the next thing you know, Simon Harris was running the country. Yes? Okay. That's it. So this is what happened. Cosgrave. Cosgrave. Uh, Cosgrave never shed the reputation of being pro-British with this top hat on him, you know, uh, if you look at the pictures of him. Uh, and they never really uh, established that. So let's have a look at paragraph one. Paragraph one, then, what we will do is we will have the 1922 Constitution, okay, establishing the doll as the legitimate body of the, the government, uh, a bicamel system, which means you've got two houses, a House of Commons, which is the Dáil, and an upper house, which is called the Shannad. Uh, and you've got the president of the executive, and it's based on a theory uh, which we talked about in lessons called the separation of powers, where you separate out the powers, like all modern constitutions, the executive, the legislative body, and the ju judiciary to examine that sort of thing. The separation of powers is that so nobody emerges as, a, um, uh, as too dominant. And then we have the establishment of the state. setting up the institutions of the state. All right? So what I'm going to do here, really, is paragraph one and two are going to be the 20s. Paragraph three and four are going to be the 30s. And paragraph five and six are going to be the 40s. So, you know, I'm getting the, I'm getting the whole of the essay in. When I'm talking about the establishment of the state, I'm talking about the institutions of the state. Civil service. Now, you can be brief with these, because we're getting all this into one paragraph, really. Civil service, guardie, local government, now lots of people don't even know what local government is and they definitely don't find it an engaging topic. Uh, so local government, if you're not too sure what it is, two lines will do on that. Okay? It's an important pillar of, uh, of establishing democracy in the co uh, country and of course the legal system. The judges and the law. Any democracy operates in a position of the law. Okay? So, that's our first part. That's a paragraph. There's a paragraph in that. Definitely a paragraph in that. Okay? And then we will look on at uh, um, paragraph two. And uh, I'll be cramming the stuff in here because there's a lot, you know. When you're answering these long questions, 1922 to 1949, it's kind of like putting everything down like a shopping list and make sure that you're mentioning everything and its relevance to, to the question. So uh, I will put in part two, I will put in the army mutiny. Definitely a threat to the state, don't you think? Okay, and how that was overcome. The Iron Mutiny of 1924. And then I would put in uh, the 
public order legislation, and we're really talking here about the years 1927, okay? 1927 and 1931, constitutional amendment act. And 27, I'm just going to see what it's called here in my notes, Public Safety Act. This was after the uh, assassination of um, uh, Kevin O'Higgins, um, who had a little bit of, created a few dangerous enemies during the Civil War. And it showed us that the, the gunmen weren't gone away in 1927. The Public Safety Act, uh, and of course, this then is part of, there's a link here with the, what we call the and this is the creation of an opposition. The Electoral Amendment Act, so that's 1927 as well, they're both 1927, that's 1931. Okay, let me explain them very briefly, okay. First of all, the, we have the army mutiny, which you, you know about and you have notes about, okay. And then in 1927, you have this spike in, uh, in violence in the state. Kevin O'Higgins is shot. It's a year of two elections, of course. It's high drama because De Valera now at this stage has formed Fianna Fáil, okay. And he contests the election of 1927, but he won't go into Parliament. He abstains. So Cosgrave uses the... Public Safety Act to introduce greater police powers, but he also introduced the Amendment Act and says, okay, enough of this. Uh, Ireland needs an opposition, a credible opposition. We can't have De Valera sitting out on the sidelines outside Parliament all the time. So he brings him into Parliament by saying, by saying, if you want to stand for a TD, not if you're going to be a TD, but if you want to stand for TD at all, then you have to take the oath. So De Valera and his Fianna Fáilers famously take the oath that caused so much trouble right back then didn't it? And De Valera famously refers to it as an empty formula and enters Parliament. In a way, Cosgrave was signing his own political death warrant there because De Valera, De Valera is going to take him in the next election. Cosgrave's never going to get power again. All right? His son does, but not him. Okay? His creation of an opposition is very, very important in the establishment of a democracy. You have to have an opposition in democracy, or else it's a sort of a sham democracy. Yeah? Like uh, maybe what Putin's got in Russia, something like that, you know? It's got an electoral system, but no credible opposition, you see? So that's it. People need a choice in democracy. Isn't that what it means from the Greek? Democracy as opposed to autocracy. Good. Right then, uh, let's move on. So that's our 20s. And of course, sorry, the Constitutional Amendment Act, very, very important. Cosgrave, you know, he wasn't uh, adverse to giving the police extra powers, which isn't exactly democratic, is it? 1931, though, was a rough year. With uh, the Depression going on uh, and the lack of people emigrating because there was nowhere to emigrate to, there was a rise in violence, there was a rise in crime, there was a rise in political agitation. Uh, the IRA were back uh, and... Uh, there was a lot of problems, a lot of violence going around the place, and uh, Cosgrave acted and said, OK, well, we're going to increase the laws of the police over the citizens, and he banned the IRA, and he banned the Irish Communist Party, which was tiny and didn't make any difference. But the IRA ban was a significant thing. Uh, De Valera, of course, accused him of, 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 of not being democratic. But he's going to do the same thing later on, OK, as we see. Good, so uh, we have that then. That's paragraph one and two, I like it. It looks good, that's the 1920s, all right? Mm. Well, 1931, you'll say. We're going to 1922 to 1932. Paragraph three, we're looking at De Valera in power, okay? Now, when De Valera gets into power, uh, he lifts the ban on the IRA. We've got the blue shirt crisis. Was it a crisis? Was it not a crisis? Were the blue shirts fascists? Uh, all of those sort of things. We've uh, been through that in lessons. 
you should know about it. Uh, and uh, of course, we, then we have um, De Valera then. Eventually bans the IRA in 1936. Uh, the ultimate political opportunist, De Valera, really. He uses everything that happens and he pounces on it, pounces on it with speech, usually to his own benefit. Uh, he's very, very good at it, although he's very unpopular. He's never, he's never got the... He fights all those elections. He fights six elections in those years. Every election that he fights, he never gets his majority. He has to go back and then find a way of getting another majority uh, and this sort of thing. So he's got a substantial amount of the, uh, of the population who distrust him. Okay, uh, we'll move on then. So we'll move on that paragraph. There's a lot in that paragraph there. And then if we're looking at the establishment of democracy, paragraph four, we're into Bunra. Now, if you don't know what this is, you should know what it is, because it's the Irish Constitution of 1937. And it's an extraordinary document. And it sets up, and it's based, like the Constitution of 1922, on what we call the separation of powers, creating an executive and a legislative body, the legislative body being the doll, the executive being the Taoiseach and the government. Uh, de Valera is very inf uh, influenced by the Irish language and puts a lot of Irish language into it. And, of course, we've got the judiciary, the separation of powers, okay? That's the philosophy behind it. Uh, and it's very democratic. So those people who feared the de Valera when he got over in 1932 would aspire to become sort of dictator like the counterparts in Europe. He didn't. He didn't. He established a very democratic uh, system. Introducing proportional, proportional representation was the form of voting. De Valera didn't like that. He wanted to change it. It would have been easier for Fianna Fáil to win majorities if he had the other system. He never got that because he also put in a referendum. Now, the referendum thing is a referendum by the people unless you want to, if you want to change the constitution. So this is a big, big thing in, the, in, in Bunrock the Heron, and it's important. Okay? Uh, so people elected by PR, constitutional refer by referendum. I'll just write them down. PR is okay, I think. You know what it is by now. And, uh, personally, I think referendum is one of the best things about living in Ireland as, a, as, uh, as a, a citizen. I remember a few years ago when they had a referendum on the European, I think it was the Treaty of Nice or the Treaty of Lisbon or one of these sorts of things. And it was a big, they had referendums on them both, by the way. But um, there was something like they did a thing that uh, there's, Five, 450 million people in Europe and four and a half million people were voting on this referendum. Everywhere else, the national parliaments were passing it through because of their constitutional models. And uh, we had this um, democratic thing. Of course, it drives the politicians and the, the Europeans mad that they have to consult the people as such, right? <coughs> That's de Valera's legacy, I suppose, to Ireland, oh, one of them, okay? Another of the legacy is your Irish language that you're, you're studying for your leaving cert because Irish took primacy in the Constitution of 1937. Ireland was set up as a dual language, Irish and English. And in the Constitution, the Irish takes precedence over the English. Right? And of course, lawyers love this because they can argue, this is what this phrase means and some other guy can go, no, it's interpreted as this and all this sort of thing. So it's given rise to all sorts of Controversy, nothing too bad. We can live with it, can't we? But when you've got your road sign, you've got it in Irish, you've got it in English, okay? If you get a summons from court and it's all in English, if you've done something bad, then you can say, well, you know, I'm not accepting this, it's not written in Irish, and all these sort of things are consequences of making the language things like that. The language was largely aspirational, though, wasn't it? Unfortunately, you do it as a compulsory subject in your leaving cert. Uh, some people want to get rid of that. The Fine Gael party as a part of its, its manifesto in 2011. Okay, so electric law, uh, let's move into the 40s, paragraph 5. The emergency. War and crisis is not good for democracy. That's why you're at home, I suppose, if we make a thing. So emergency powers for government. Emergency powers of government are fine. 
The problem with emergency powers in government in the past is if you give a government emergency powers and they don't want to give it back. Right? And that's where we have the problems. De Valera introduced and made Ireland neutral in World War II and he produced emergency legislation. And of course, the IRA began a campaign uh, and De Valera came down on them really, really hard. That old alliance is gone for sure. Uh, he also set up the G2 division within the army, the intelligence gathering, right? And uh, of course, there was extreme censorship. Including the weather forecasts. Do you know? I wish I'd censor the weather forecasts now. So, censorship. Uh, and then, of course, we'll, we've got a good paragraph there. There's lots to write there. And paragraph uh, six then would be the period 1945 to 1949. Okay? And uh, really, there's a lot of economic story here. Uh, De Valera, for example, did you know this? Had to introduce rationing, reintroduce rationing in 1947. Uh, there was a, a, an eight-week patch of snow and weather in 1947, and rationing had been introduced. This is one of the reasons for the fall of De Valera's government. Right? We have then, in 1947, the biggest thing that happens after the war is the inter-party government. In the election of 1948, all the other parties were so sick of De Valera for 16 years. They all got together and they threw him out. Okay? There was an alliance between Fine Gael and Cumann Gael, who were or just, uh, Cumann, yeah, Cumann Gael, isn't it? Yeah. No, sorry, Clan the Publica. Cumann Gael is uh, a different. Well, Clan the Publica. Clan the Publica were the old IRA. So it was anti treaty people, pro treaty people getting in together in an alliance just to get rid of De Valera and they set up this thing called the inter-party government. They said it would never work, okay, the inter-party government. The inter-party government declared the Republic of Ireland. And when are they going to bring it in? Easter Monday, right? Easter Monday. 1949. Easter Monday, after Pierce's declaration on the steps of the GPO in 1916. So there's the symmetry in the question, you know what I mean? That, that's how it goes full circle. So by 1949, though, Ireland was a democratic country. It was a consolidated democratic country. It had several bouts of elections now, okay? And this idea of the democracy being consolidated had been carried out. And that would be a nice little essay on that one there. If it comes up in the exam, paragraph 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 42 and a half minutes, 2 minutes to plan, 40 minutes to write, 30 seconds to read over and carry, carry out and, 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 and amend any mistakes.